The most important words in the Bible to translate correctly are the words of the prophet we are required to hear and obey. These are the words of Yeshua, who said that he did not come to bring peace to the earth, but rather a sword of division that would separate intimate friends and estrange even the closest families. He brought a sword of truth, sharper than any man-made instrument, a dagger that cuts straight to the heart of every matter, a blade that separates truth from tradition, fact from fantasy, relationship from religion. Yeshua repeatedly and vehemently violated the carefully crafted rules and regulations of first century Phariseeism. He dropped the plumb line to separate the eternal instructions of the Almighty from the rules invented to intimidate, manipulate, and control the masses. Yeshua's words deliver us from every form of tyranny over the mind of man, and the truth he articulated sets us free from the bondage of religion. Now, in Yeshua's final address, the book of the Revelation, he wants his servants to know the things that must come to pass in the last days. The victory has been won, but our battle is not over until the last trumpet sounds on Yom Teruah, the day of trumpets. Most Christians, like Jews, read the Bible like a software licensing agreement. They quickly scroll to the bottom and click I agree so that they can use the program, but they have no understanding of that to which they have just committed themselves. Denominations select numbered sound bites out of the text to justify or condemn anything they please, but seldom do they take the necessary time to read and understand the scriptures in context. This is especially true of the fifth gospel, the good news of the revelation of Yeshua as the Messiah and Almighty Judge. The revelation is the one and only book that Yeshua wrote personally. Just as Baruch was the scribe for the prophet Jeremiah, Yohanan was both scribe and messenger to get Yeshua's revelation to his servants, to the seven assemblies of Asia Minor, and from there to the rest of the world. The book of the revelation of Yeshua Messiah was addressed to and can only be understood by the servants of Yeshua, or more accurately, the sold out bond slaves of Yeshua. The King James Version reads, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant, Yohanan, John who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ in all things that he saw. Yohanan was told by Yeshua that he was to be his personal messenger to deliver this message to those who were bond slaves in the service of Yeshua. Though the translators decided to translate the Greek word agilos as angel in verse one, they translated that same word as messenger when referring to John the Baptist, Yohanan ben Zachariah. Though there are divine messengers introduced later in the book that should be translated as angels, there are no angelic intermediaries in the first three chapters. Yeshua reveals these things directly to Yohanan, who is instructed in verse 19, write the things which thou hast just seen and write the things which are now, and write the things which shall be hereafter. These are the three chronological sections into which Yeshua divides the revelation. The things which you have just seen, the things which are now, and the things which shall come to pass in the future. This is the order of events that Yeshua was given by his heavenly Father to communicate to us. These are perhaps the most important words in the entirety of scriptures to understand accurately and to hear and obey. 
those who ignore Yeshua will find themselves in a world of confusion as deception and division sweeps the nations of the world in the last days. In chapter two, verse one, the King James read, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write these things. Again, these are human messengers who are to deliver the revelation to each of the seven assemblies. Whenever the Greek word agalos appears in the gospels, one must determine from the context if this is a human or a divine messenger. Don't make the mistake of thinking of angels as having wings, singing songs, or playing harps. Not once in the scriptures does this artistic fantasy appear. Angels are invariably identified as men, sometimes fearfully imposing, but never as chubby little cherubs or winged supermodels. Angels are angels. People are people. Dead people do not become angels. Dead people are awaiting the resurrection. Only Yeshua and the 24 elders who were raised as the first fruits from among the dead are in heaven now. Yeshua presented those who arose when he arose before the Father's throne in heaven on the morning of Yom HaBikarim, day of the first fruits, the morning after his resurrection. These 24 elders, the first fruits, are the only ones who are seen playing harps and singing in the throne room of heaven. Thousands of your dead relatives are not floating around heaven helping you to win your next ball game or ace your next algebra test. They are in the grave and are awaiting whichever resurrection they have attained. Some will be raised at the coming of the Messiah and will be clothed with an incorruptible body and will receive their reward on the sea of fire and glass. They will rule the earth with Messiah for a thousand years. Yeshua said that the vast majority of humanity will be raised and judged in the last resurrection. At the end of the book of the Revelation, Yeshua takes us to the day of judgment at the time of the last resurrection. People suddenly wake up and find themselves shaking uncontrollably in the midst of a sea of humanity standing naked on a stark white pavement. There are no pearly gates. There are no streets of gold. There is no sign of Peter anywhere. Most have no clue as to why they are there. You recognize no one, no friends, no family. You are just one in the midst of a billion people standing under a light more piercing than the sun. You are too stunned to speak. All you hear is weeping and cries of anguish. As your eyes begin to focus in the intense light, you look around. There's no place to run, no place to hide. You made your choices in life and you finally realize that you're going to have to live with your choices for eternity. Pay close attention to the words of Yeshua. Disregard the religious ranting of pulpit pundits who make up their own rules and regulations. Make wise choices that will circumvent a rude awakening at the last resurrection. Yeshua said, blessed is he that takes part in the first resurrection. Upon him the second death hath no power, and they will live with Messiah for a thousand years. We as believers don't always get it right. But what about the apostles? Did they get it right? Michael Rood presents the Acts of the Apostles, a special teaching available only in September. In order to understand the book of Acts, we have to go back to the opening and closing statements of the former treaties. In the Acts of the Apostles, Michael Rood sets the stage for the book of Acts. It's not for sale and it's not on YouTube but we'll send it to you as a thank you for your donation of just $50. Or with a donation of $100 or more, we'll send you the teaching plus a silver-plated shofar candle holder. You'll get this special gift plus the Acts of the Apostles, a new teaching by Michael Rood. 
Call now or visit us online at monthlylovegift.com to pledge your support and receive these exclusive gifts. Yohanan wrote, I was in the spirit in the day of Yehovah, and I heard behind me a great voice like the blast of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What you see, write in a scroll and send it to the seven assemblies which are in Asia Minor. I turned to see the voice that spoke to me and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. In the midst of the lampstands, one like the Son of Man was clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about with a golden sash. His hair was white as snow. His eyes were a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished brass, purified in a furnace. His voice thundered like the roaring waves of the ocean. He had seven stars in his right hand. The words of his mouth were as sharp as a two-edged sword. His face shone brighter than the noonday sun. And when I saw him, I fell down dead at his feet. Then he laid his hand on me and said, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that is alive and was dead. Now, behold, I am alive forevermore. And now I have the keys of death and hell. Amen. Then he said to me, Write the things which you have just seen, and write the things which are now, and write the things which shall come to pass in the future. Everything Yohanan has just seen, he is told to write in the scroll. Jesus does not have gentle brown eyes and a soft smile on his lips. Yeshua's hair and beard are lightning white, blowing wild in the wind. His eyes are on fire. His voice shakes the gates of heaven. And he is walking in the midst of us, and no one can hide from him. Yeshua is going to straighten things out. As he promised at the Last Supper before Passover, he will cut off the worthless branches that bear no fruit any minute. And now, I will declare to you the meaning of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the meaning of the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the messengers to the seven assemblies, and the seven lampstands are the seven assemblies. Until the meaning of the vision of the seven stars and seven lampstands was revealed, it was a mystery. The seven messengers of the seven assemblies are in his hands. No one touches them without his consent, and they answer to him, not the people. They are his messengers, not messengers of an approved theological cemetery or denomination. The lampstands are the seven assemblies. Yes, he is walking in our midst. He sees everything we are doing. Are we doing what he commanded his disciples to do, or, or are we making up our comfortable religions in marketing membership into our congregations with catchy, seeker-friendly slogans. Yeshua said, Write to the messenger of the church of Ephesus. These things saith he that holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. To the assembly in Ephesus, as with each of his letters to the seven assemblies, Yeshua starts out with a reference to the vision that Yohanan saw of him. He wants them to know his position and authority, and that he is not to be trifled with. I will illustrate Yeshua's point by reading the opening of each of these letters to the seven assemblies. To the messenger of the assembly of Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works. Verse 12. To the messenger of the assembly of Pergamos write, These things saith he which has the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works. Verse 18. To the messenger of the assembly in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who has his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. 
I know thy works. Chapter three, verse one. To the messenger of the assembly in Sardis write, these things saith he that has the seven spears of God and the seven stars, I know thy works. Verse seven. To the messenger of the assembly in Philadelphia write, these things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that opens and no man shuts, and shuts and no man opens. I know thy works. King David is dead, buried, and his grave was still among them and well known in the first century. But Yeshua has the keys to death and hell, the grave. One day Yeshua will throw both death and hell into the lake of fire. Both will be destroyed forever. Verse 14, to the messenger of the assembly of the Laodiceans, right? These things saith the Amen, the faithful true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works. Anything that Yeshua repeats seven times needs to be heeded. I know your works. I know everything that you are doing, the good, the bad, and the ugly. There is no place to run and nowhere to hide. I know what is going on and I am letting you know so that you can correct things. If you don't correct them, then I will. And if I have to do it, it won't be a pretty picture. So often I've heard insults hurled at the Almighty. How can there be a God when there's so much suffering and starvation and disease and evil in the world? Fools, fools, that is our job. We are the ones who feed the starving help the sick, protect the weak and innocent, care for those who are hurting. It is our job to repair what evil men have destroyed. Don't blame the Almighty because of the laziness or self-absorption of those who do not care enough to help those who are less fortunate. Atheists and other religious fanatics who want to rule the world are responsible for the mass murder of far more than 200 million people in past millennium if not for Christians and Jews, whose prophets absolutely forbids men stealing under the punishment of death, slavery and human trafficking would still be legal in most of the world. Today, it is still practiced because laws enacted by godly men are ignored by those who profit from such inhumanity to their fellow men. Some things can only be fixed by God, such as a covering for our sin and our ignorance. Other things are left in our hands to make right. If we don't do our job, don't blame the Creator for what He left in our hands. Some people learn the hard way. Some people never learn. The revelation is for the servants to know what they need to correct before the King of Kings steps into the ring with the rod of iron. We as believers don't always get it right. But what about the apostles? Did they get it right? Michael Rood presents the Acts of the Apostles, a special teaching available only in September. In order to understand the book of Acts, we have to go back to the opening and closing statements of the former treaties. In the Acts of the Apostles, Michael Rood sets the stage for the book of Acts. It's not for sale and it's not on YouTube but we'll send it to you as a thank you for your donation of just $50. Or with a donation of $100 or more, we'll send you the teaching plus a silver-plated shofar candle holder. You'll get this special gift plus the Acts of the Apostles, a new teaching by Michael Rood. Call now or visit us online at monthlylovegift.com to pledge your support and receive these exclusive gifts. Each letter to the seven assemblies begins with Yeshua illustrating his presence among those who are called by his name. He knows what is going on and he has correction for each of them. But after the correction, there is encouragement for them to stay faithful to the end. 
for those who hear and obey the words of the prophet, he makes a promise to them that will not be available until the new heaven and earth are established at the end of Yeshua's thousand year reign upon the earth. In Revelation chapter two, verse seven, those of Ephesus that overcome, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. That paradise, or Gan Eden in Hebrew, does not exist on the earth at this time. Adam was ejected from the garden so that he would not eat of the tree of life. On the new heaven and earth, the paradise that was lost will be restored. The fulfillment of that promise is found in Revelation 22, verse one. Then the angel showed me a pure, living river of water, as clear as crystal, which proceeded out from the throne room of Yehovah and the Lamb. In the midst of the street and on each side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruit and yielded her fruit every month. Chapter two, verse 11. Those of Smyrna that overcome shall not be hurt of the second death. The fulfillment of that promise is found in Revelation 21, verse seven. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his Elohim, his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Chapter two, verse 17. Those of Pergamos that overcome will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knows except he that receives it. In the hall of judgment, the black stone is the guilty verdict, but the white stone is the stone of acquittal. There is no not guilty verdict. It is the verdict that the price has been paid and you have been acquitted by the one who paid the death penalty for you. In chapter two, verse 26, those of Thyatira that overcome and keep my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father, and I will give him the morning star. Here, Yeshua makes a promise to the assembly at Thyatira that they will rule with him during the millennial reign as well as enjoy the reward of the new heaven and earth. The fulfillment of that promise is found in Revelation 20, verse six. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them and they shall be priest of Yehovah and of Messiah, and they shall reign with him a thousand years. This cannot be construed that those of Thyatira are the only ones who will reign with him, but they are the ones who need the additional encouragement because of the hardships that they will endure just to make it to the end. In chapter three, verse five, those of Sardis that overcome the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. The fulfillment of that promise is found in Revelation 20, verse 14. Death and hell were then cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Whosoever was not found written in the scroll of life was also cast into the lake. It is obvious from Yeshua's warning that names can be blotted out of the book of life, as was the name of Judas. But those who overcome are promised eternal access into the new Jerusalem. Chapter three, verse 12. Those of Philadelphia that overcome, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. And I will write upon him the name of my God, in the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. The fulfillment of that promise is found in Revelation 21, verse one. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The former heaven and earth had passed away and there was no more sea. And I, Yohanan, saw the holy city, 
New Jerusalem coming down from Yehovah out of heaven, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. Chapter three, verse 21. Those of Laodicea that overcome, I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and have sat down with my father in his throne. The fulfillment of that promise is found in Revelation 21, verse three. Then I heard a great shout out of heaven. Behold, the tabernacle of Yehovah is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and Yehovah himself will be with them, and will be their God, their Elohim. Before the brimstone hits the fan, Yeshua wants his servants to know the things that are waiting for those who endure faithfully to the end and engage in the end time harvest. In our next episode, we're going to dig into the things that Yeshua confronts in the first century churches that have reached epidemic stages in modern churchianity today. You have known for a long time that things are not right in the Christian world, but you couldn't quite put your finger on it. Well, Yeshua put his finger on it then and gives a stern warning to those that turn a blind eye to the perversions in the church. Either straighten up or come out of the Babylonian mystery religious system before he burns it to the ground. It is on this bleak and desolate Isle of Patmos that John received the revelation of Yeshua as the Messiah, the almighty judge who will rule the earth with absolute power and authority. Though the rulers of this world conspire against Yehovah and against the Messiah, the Almighty will have them in derision as their plans of global dominion are incinerated before their eyes. The minions who have bowed at the feet of Satan for their peace of the new world order will have their hopes dashed upon the rock as Yeshua destroys those who attempt to annihilate Israel and nullify the everlasting covenant God made with his people. Yes, all of the land from the Euphrates to the Nile belongs to the sons of Israel. Every nation that stands against that covenant will find itself on the battlefield against the Almighty. I'm Michael Rood, bidding you shalom, peace. And I will see you on the sea of fire and glass when the smoke clears.